Hello, welcome to the Monday, July 10th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Stockheim, Germany. Let's start with a couple of diaries from this weekend. On Friday, Renato wrote about uh, another wave sort of of these DDoS extortion demands. We had covered them about two weeks ago. Back then, they were pretty much all totally fake and nothing really happened if you didn't pay. This new wave is a little bit different. Now, they still claim to come from the Armada Collective. Of course, that particular group is pretty much the Defunct, but I guess they're sort of using that brand in order to make people more likely to comply with their demands. The other thing that is different here is that they offer actually a demonstration of their firepower. And we do have a couple of reports where people reported they actually saw these pretty short, usually 15 minute long denial of service attacks happen. And that of course then gets people to pay up for the demand. However, the other report we also got from the people that did experience these initial denial of service attacks was that they weren't really all that large, definitely not as large as promised in the emails. So if you have a half a decent anti-denial of service strategy, you should be fine against this kind of attack. Now, of course, it is important that you do have a plan to deal with denial of service attacks anyway. So that's probably the best way to spend your effort and money. Do not pay the ransom. Some of these demands were actually quite expensive, sort of in the 10 Bitcoin range, which is uh, sort of 10, $20,000 uh, these uh, days. And once you pay, then of course, they know that you are a willing victim and that you will pay again. So likely they'll just come back and ask for more money or for another payment in a couple of months. And in other diaries, we got one by Xavier about how to deal with obfuscated VB script and how to deobfuscate base64 data. And then a rather extensive diary by Russ. Russ is talking about SoftElk. SoftElk is a Linux distribution that is distributed for free as part of the SANS forensics community. Phil Hagen is behind this particular distribution and Russ is sort of walking Walking you through how you can use this particular distribution to then look for any compromises in your network. And then some good news if you got infected with the GoldenEye, Misha or Petya ransomware strains. The master key apparently was published for uh, these ransomware families. And as a result, uh, people who have infected files that got encrypted should be able to decrypt it using this master key. Now, while this is good news for these older types of ransomware, NotPetya will not be recoverable by this key. For NotPetya infections that happened over the last few weeks, the secret key was actually lost on the system as the encryption happened, supposedly a coding error. That's also why some people called NotPetya a wiper, not really ransomware. So for those infected systems, uh, recovery key will most likely not work. And Talus, the research part of Cisco, has an interesting story about some malware they found recently that took advantage of Word templates. The initial trigger here was, as usual, a Word document. It arrived as an email attachment. Uh, now, what was sort of different here was that the Word document did not include any macros. Typically, you would expect a macro that then installs malware, but they went a step further. The Word document instead referred to a template that was uh, saved on an SMB file share. So at that point, the client system would reach out via SMB to this remote host. That connection then can also be used to harvest credentials, of course, from the user. And the template came back would then load the macros and start your usual malicious interaction. 
For a more sophisticated attack like this and targeting specific energy companies, what surprised me a little bit is that the emails themselves were not actually made all that well. They mostly claimed to contain resumes and environmental test reports. Second part uh, is probably a little bit more specific uh, for uh, these particular companies. But overall, the big problem here, I think, was that the mail filters let these emails through because they didn't see any macros within the documents. Of course, another huge problem here is that uh, these companies allowed outbound port 445 connections. That's, of course, absolutely dangerous given that this can very easily be used to load additional malware and to harvest credentials from users. Well, uh, that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.